Amen. Tell me I need to stand still this morning. Hope you remember that every day. Hope you remember that every day. That blood is the only reason that we're here this morning. The only way that we have a, a daily life, the only way that we have anything is because of the blood. Don't ever forget that. This morning, I want us to look at the power of discipline. So we look at the book of Hebrews, and it's the passage in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. I left out the first two verses because they're the most read, the most studied. Those first two verses talks about that great cloud of witnesses. And there's a lot of speculation of who that is. But I can tell you that there's discipline involved. And one of the things that we forget sometimes is that we are nowhere under grace, and that grace is sufficient. But there is the need very often for some discipline. And sometimes it's, it's kind of like when you wake up in the morning and you've got a busy day of plan and you've got things you want to do. You don't think right then is a good time to spend time praying. But that discipline of praying, when you say, I'm going to do it and I'm doing it whether I want to or not, eventually you will start to want to. It's amazing how discipline helps us want to do what we need to do. It's not the end all, it's not the be all, but it is a discipline to do what we need to do to allow it to become a part of our life. Someone has said if you do something 30 days, 30 days in a row every day, it becomes a habit and becomes something you do all the time. Discipline is involved in that. And sometimes we're, right now particularly, we're saying, oh, woe is me. And there's a lot of folks having issues right now, a lot of big people having issues finding food and getting food. The incomes are down. People don't have what they once had. And sometimes we say, well, we can't do what we once did. Yesterday, or Friday, I guess, I was in a restaurant. I'm not going to tell you where because I don't want to get them in trouble. But I walked in and a fellow who I hadn't seen, I didn't remember seeing him, he said that he'd come to church here and he reached up and he walked up to me and he said, hey, pastor, and he stuck his hand out and instinctively, I stuck my hand out, and we shook hands. And I remember thinking, uh-oh, I messed up. So we got to the table, I got some hand sanitizer. It's sad because I missed that probably much as anything I miss. At church, it's the shaking of hands, the hugs, the fellowship, the closeness. And sometimes we feel put upon. We, we say, well, that's so tough. But here in verse 3, the Bible says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Folks, when we begin to think it's tough on us, we begin to think life is tough, our situation is tough. And, and listen, I'm not putting down your situation. I don't know your situation. Some, there are some people, maybe some here, who are not getting a paycheck. I don't know. But the reality is this. No matter what we're going through, the Bible tells us to consider the one who endured far more than we ever endured. When we consider what Jesus went through, everything else pales in comparison. Now, there are people who have been falsely accused. Maybe you're one of them. Maybe you've been falsely accused of something that you didn't do. There are also people who have been beaten. In our world today, if you go look at the martyrs and look at the, the voices of the martyrs, you'll see people who were beaten, who were killed. We've had people that were deserted by their friends. And maybe you're here today and your friends have deserted you. And, and it's difficult for you. You're lonely. It's so difficult sometimes when our friends have deserted us. We've been rejected. And sometimes for no good reason, just because somebody decides to reject you. Not because you did something to cause them, but sometimes they just reject you. And there have been some people that have been 
spit on for the gospel. I remember a friend of mine was in India and he was trying to share the gospel. All of a sudden, a fellow who had kind of been away from him, he began to bring up something from deep within his throat. And he turned to my friend and spit in his face. Now, mind you, this friend of mine had been a linebacker in a major college football team. He was not a wimp. He was not one that I'd want to spit in his face. Although I knew he was a man of God. And he said the hardest thing for him in his life was when that guy spit in his face. He wanted to send him to his reward right then. But he said, the discipline of God began to work in my heart and said, you can't do that. If you hit this man, if you hurt this man, if you cause this man harm, he may never accept Jesus. So when the man spit in his face, he took a handkerchief, wiped his face, and said to the man, God loves you, and I still love you. God will always love you, and I will love you. Now, the man never made a profession of faith. He was an angry Muslim. And he was spitting in a man's face whose only offense was to say, God loves you, and Jesus loves you. Some people have been mocked. If you're here this morning and you haven't been mocked, I'm amazed. All of us have. It's not, it's not uh, isolated. It's universal. We all get mocked about something. But none had it all. I don't think anybody went through everything except the Lord Jesus Christ. And he went through it even though he was 100% innocent. The Bible even tells us that he went about doing good. Even Josephus, who was a Jewish historian, said there was a man named Jesus. He was not a Christian. Josephus was not a Christian. As far as we know, never became a Christian. But he said in the historical record that this man was crucified, although he never did anything but good for anybody. He went about the region doing good. But yet, he was, he was spit on. He was mocked. He was a falsely accused. Everything that you and I have ever gone through, he went through it all. But not one word did he say against his accusers. Not one time did he say, you can't do that. The Bible says he could have called down 10,000 angels when he was on the cross. They would have come in a heartbeat. I suspect many of them were up there in heaven just saying, turn me loose, Father. But he, stood on the, he hung on the cross because of discipline. He took the sin of the world on his, on his body, hanging on the cross because of discipline. He could have easily come down off that cross. As a matter of fact, one of the two malefactors who were crucified with him said, if you're really God, come down off this cross and save us and yourself. But the reality is, discipline held him there because he wanted to do what God had called him to do. He chose to do what God called him to do. And so very often we need to remember that. When times get tough, when we want to rebel against what's going on, when we want to be angry about something, we need to remember that Jesus went through all that. He went to the cross and spoke not a word. He was disciplined. The Bible tells us to remember his example Remember it. He said, consider him who endured such hostility. And then in verses 4 through 6, he says, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Folks, sometimes, and I think probably more often than we ever realize, those things that bother us 
are caused by God, not just allowed by God, but caused by Him to grow us, to teach us. We need to be willing to persevere in the midst of trials. Jesus is our example, but there are others who have persevered. All across this world, there are people who are persevering in spite of their circumstances, in spite of what they do. I, I know in, in China and Vietnam, uh, there are churches having services today. They've already had them in many cases and will have them later. But they have, they have services. And they have to sneak in and have to sit down, persevere. They'll have to be wary of somebody knocking at the door. They'll have to be careful in every way. But every Sunday they get together. In some cases every Tuesday, every Thursday, whatever day it is, sometimes two or three times a week, they'll get together and they'll persevere in their walk with the Lord. And they will remember that sometimes the chastening comes from God. And we in America have been spoiled. We, we don't like that chastening. We want everything to be good. We're, we're Americans. We, we, can't, we can't handle that stuff. I remember my first trip to Vietnam. Actually, my second trip to Vietnam. First trip on a mission trip. And I was a little bit irritated with the missionaries. They were there because they said, Now we're going to pray for our meal. But we're, whoever prays, just keep your eyes open. Everybody keep your eyes open. Keep looking around. And we're going to pray for the food. They won't know what we're doing when we do that. <clears throat> my first instinct was I think we ought to stand up bow our heads close our eyes and <clears throat> announce to the whole restaurant we're going to pray but I talked with the missionary afterwards and I said tell me why it is that y'all are concerned and the missionary said oh we're not concerned for ourselves but if someone is following one of our members and one of these young men who is leading Bible studies and they see us pray especially Americans, then they will follow him. He'll disappear and we'll never see him again. I remember saying, is that bad? And they said, yes, sir, Reverend Burns, this is not America. But we in America sometimes feel like that we deserve better than, than anybody else. And I know that Americans work hard. I know that we have certain inalienable rights. It's in our Constitution. But at the same time, we need to understand we need to persevere in our walk with God. We need to be willing to strive against those things that are sin. And we need to be willing to, to accept the chastisement of the Lord and persevere through that. We grow when we do that. Now, I, it's obvious that I never did a lot of this, but I remember a guy in school that grew very muscular. But he would pick up the weights and he would pick it up and over and over and over and over and over again. And I remember thinking as a high school student, if it takes that to get strong, I'll never be strong. This friend of mine would go in the weight room and, and lift weights until his skin turned purple because he went as long as he could go. But he was one of the strongest men for his size I'd ever seen in my life because he persevered and the resistance was like a chastisement. It was like a, a, some hardship. And that resistance to the weight over and over again, that's what builds our muscles is that resistance to the weight. And we need to resist the sin of this world. We need to resist the philosophy of this world and persevere in God. And he said, we shouldn't despise when God chastens us. God says, does that to his children. In uh, Acts seven sixty. Stephen would not, deny his, no, would not deny his Lord. And he said, as they stoned him to death, as he looked into heaven, he said, I can see Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And he said, Jesus, don't lay this charge at their feet. Don't blame them for this. And he persevered. Now, I don't know about you, but when I grew up, on the rare occasions that I did something my dad didn't like,
dad would, would discipline me. He would chastise me. As I grew older, it wasn't physical. But I, I reached that point in my life that I did not want to disappoint my dad. So when he was disappointed, that hurt me more than the physical beating. That hurt me more than a physical chastisement. And here we see in Acts, we see Stephen who lost his life not because of anything that he did wrong, no sin. It was an opportunity for the world to see the commitment of one man to Jesus. If we keep reading Acts, over in Acts 22, you see where James was beheaded. What was, it, what was his great crime? His only crime was he was the pastor of a local church. And he shared the gospel. And he loved people. And he loved them enough to tell them that Jesus loved them. And so he lost his head, literally. And he died. Yet, not one place do you see either of those two men ever complain and say, why me? Matter of fact, when they went to heaven, I'm sure they said, wow. They may have said, why me? But it was why me getting here so early. Why me not having to go through the rest of this life on earth? Now, remember, too, as, as we see in, in these verses uh, 5 and 6, God chastens his own. God disciplines his own. If you can sin and there's no chastening, there's no repentance needed, or you don't see anything that bother, doesn't bother you at all, if you can do that, you better check to see if you're really a child. If you can sneak around and do things that you know your parents don't like, you know that your family doesn't like, you know that those who are close to you don't like, if you can do that and get by with it and not have any kind of conviction in your life, you better check if Jesus is living inside of you. You see, we have the Holy Spirit of the living God living inside of us, and when that happens, Sin bothers him. And if it bothers him, it should bother us. And if we don't feel chastened by the Lord, we may not be his child. The Bible says that. He scourges every son whom he receives. We will be disciplined by God for our sins. Now, we won't have to be set, separated from him for all eternity because of our sins, because Jesus paid for our sins. But there's a chastisement. There's a sense of conviction when we sin. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says that. He said it's an act of love to discipline your children. In fact, you know, those of you who have children, those of you who have grandchildren, sometimes it's not an act of love if you let them do what they want to do when you know it's wrong. What's right is to discipline them so they will be what God has called them to be in their, in their life as an adult. But then there's also a part of that is the encouragement of chastening. Look at verses 7 through 10. He said, if you endure it, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? That should encourage us. That conviction, that chastisement, we ought to say, thank you, Lord, because you're my father. If you can't say that, if it bothers you to get chastised, then you need to say, wait a minute, am I really a child of God? There is an issue there when you can't say that. The very act of chastening should encourage us because it indicates our sonship, our daughtership. It means that God loves us, and he loves us enough to grow us. And sometimes those things he puts in our lives, and sometimes that sin that we get chastised for is what grows us to be all that God wants us to be. Look at verse 8. But, you, but if you are without chastening, of which all have been partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. It's not just saying, oh, I'm encouraged because God chastened me. It's saying that if he doesn't chasten you, and you have known sin in your life, that you know it's sin, 
and it doesn't bother you, then there's a good chance you're not his son. You're illegitimate. You're playing a game. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how many times you've come to Sunday school and Wednesday night and worship services, and how many revivals you've gone to, how many Bible studies, how many times you've read the Bible, how often that you do good deeds. The reality is chastening is one of the ways that we know we're a child of the king and not a child of the king of this world. That's when we're chastened because of what God tells us to do, because of God intervenes in our lives and God convicts us of sin, that's the indication that we're his child. How much more should we appreciate and respect our Father? The Bible says here that we respect our, hip, our earthly fathers because they discipline us. And I'm sure that some of you out there, like me, can look back on those years when your father disciplined you, your mother disciplined you, and you didn't like it. I didn't like it always. But as I look back on it, sometimes now I like it. I told you before, I, I learned the discipline of work from my dad, who irritated me to no end. When I worked for him the first summer, I worked for him. We worked for the same contractor, and my dad did a different area on that part of the house. And so the contractor said for me to go work for my dad. Now, the typical construction site, it, you get there at 7 o'clock, then you get ready, and by 7.15, 7.20, you get started working. And then in the afternoon, if you're working 10-hour days, at about 5.15, you pick up your tools, and at 5.30, you're in the car and heading home after a full 10 hours. My dad didn't do that. We got there at a quarter to seven so that at seven o'clock we were working. And then when I decided to pick up the tools at a quarter to five, a quarter after five, he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm picking up the tools. He said, it's not 5.30. I said, dad, all the other crews pick up their tools at 5.15. I said, he said, we don't do that. He said, that's stealing and you're not gonna steal if you're gonna be in, in my son. And he said, that's, if you don't work 10 hours and get paid for 10 hours, you're stealing whatever you didn't work. And I didn't like it that first summer. Most of the summer I didn't like it because I was earlier getting to work and later getting home than anybody else. But I look back on that a few years into my career and I saw that that was a very valuable lesson that his discipline taught me, his chastening taught me. So how much more? Should we be disciplined when the Father chastens us? And finally this morning, verse 11 says there's the experience of chastisement. There, there's a, an experience there that we don't need to miss. He said, no, now no chastise, chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful nevertheless. Afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. After it's over. We don't understand it going through it sometimes. We don't understand this whole is issue with us out here in the parking lot. And it's because of an unseen enemy, because of a virus. And we sometimes get irritated with that. And we say, well, we, can, we should be able to do what we want to do. Yes, maybe so. But the reality is God may be using that in our lives. God may be teaching us something that we need to learn and understand in a powerful way. When we endure, we, it will not only be good for us, but it will eventually be welcomed by us. And as you go through the chastisement of the Lord, if that's what this is, then it will bring fruit. It will bring in joy, the fruit of the Spirit, joy, and peace, long-suffering. We learn that by doing what God's called us to do and being what God's called us. And going back to verses 1 and 2, that's what we see here in these first two verses. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, 
and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, that's how we get into that great cloud of witnesses. It's those who have used the example of Jesus and followed his example in enduring. Those who have been exhorted to persevere and those who have been chastened and been encouraged by it and those who have been chastened and had an experience of joy and peace in the midst of it. So this morning, I want to encourage you to be reminded that whatever you're going through, it's not as bad as what Jesus went through. It's not as painful as what Jesus went through. It doesn't hurt as much as what Jesus went through. But whatever it is, God can use it in your life. And he can use it in your witness. He can use it for your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. Because if, as our lives are changed and molded by a holy God into the person that he wants us to be, the world will take notice. Your neighbors will take notice. Your co-workers, your family that may seem indifferent to you will take notice because of your willingness to allow God to mold you and make you. This morning we're going to close in prayer and receive an offering. We just the offering is uh, someone said they forgot their offering and they get it this next week. And I said, let's remember, we meet here on Sunday and, and Wednesday about every week. So it's no big deal. You do what God tells you to do. Don't worry about forgetting something. That's not a mortal sin, by the way. So if you didn't bring your offering this morning, that's fine. If you did, we'll receive it. But also let me remind you, Wednesday again at 6 p.m., not 6.30, but 6 p.m., we will meet inside and outside. Those who feel comfortable coming in, we hopefully will have masks. Uh, we will should have them by Sunday note with no problem. If you don't have a mask, we'll have masks that you can use. If you're comfortable inside, we'll have a great time inside. If you're not comfortable inside, stay outside in your car. Listen to it on the radio. We're going to broadcast it on the radio only on Wednesday and Sunday. For those who are not comfortable coming in and being in a crowd. And I'm told that's the issue is the crowd sitting for a while. So we will have services inside and outside Wednesday and Sunday and we'll see how that goes and if you'll be voting how you want it to go if all of you drive up here and stay in your car then the vote is we're not going inside if all of you come up here and get out of your car and come inside then the vote is we're not parking outside and listening so it's, it's your vote you vote the way you feel led to vote so let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close and then we'll receive the offering and that'll be the end of our service. Father, we thank you again for the great privilege we have to worship you. Lord, this is not our normal worship the way we have always done it. But Father, I'm reminded that there's nothing constant but change. We cannot be consistent in anything except change. And so Father, as we worship you today, I pray our hearts are in tune together. Even though we can't be close together, our hearts can be knitted together in, as one to worship you. I thank you for the music that we had today, the, the singing and the majesty of, the, the, of that wonderful chorus of majesty. Lord, we pray that you just continue to give us an atmosphere of worship throughout the rest of this day and tomorrow and Tuesday and then Wednesday as we come back, that we would come having worshiped already, having spent time with you already. And now, Father, we worship in giving, and we pray that you would uh, tell our, our hearts what to do, not what we have been told is necessary or obligation, that we would give according to what you've told us and the way you've told us to give. Father, we'll give you any praise and glory for anything that happens, and Lord, we thank you for every gift, the gift and the giver, we pray that our using of that money would be an investment in your kingdom. Not just spending money, but investing in the kingdom of God that we might see it grow as only you can grow. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Once the offering buckets have passed your car, you are dismissed. <laughs>